All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Midday Science Cafe on machine learning featuring Daniel Brown and Tess Smith. My name is Rosalind Sarvey. I am the Public Engagement Specialist for Science at Cal. I will be one of your co-hosts today, along with Jen Tang from Berkeley Lab, who I'll introduce in just a few minutes. I wanted to start off this program with a land acknowledgement to recognize that Berkeley sits on the Huchun territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. Every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. By offering this land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes the history of the land on which we stand, but also recognizes that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. A little bit more about Science at Cal. We celebrate science through our public programs, including this Midday Science Cafe, as well as our lecture series, festivals. We typically are uh, doing outreach in the community and on campus at UC Berkeley. Of course, we're not able to do that right now, but we hope um, in the fall that we can be back with you all in person. Uh, if you're not familiar with our programs, you can follow us on the web at scienceatcal.berkeley.edu. We also have a newsletter that you can subscribe to to um, be in the know of all of our upcoming programs. Uh, we also are active on social media. We have a Facebook, a Twitter, and an Instagram page, and you can follow us at Science at Cal. I'm going to now go ahead and introduce you to Jen Tang from Berkeley Lab, uh, who will share a little bit more with you. Thanks. As Rosalind mentioned, my name's Jen, and I'm the Director for Federal and Community Relations at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. As folks might know, Berkeley Lab is one of 17 US Department of Energy national laboratories across the country. And we're supported by DOE's Office of Science and managed by the University of California. All of the research we conduct at the lab is unclassified. Since our founding back in 1931 by a UC Berkeley physics professor named Ernest Orlando Lawrence, Berkeley Lab's been dedicated to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking science solutions to some of the greatest problems facing humankind. This year, 2021, actually marks the lab's 90th birthday. And as we celebrate our past achievements and imagine what discoveries the next 90 years might bring, we hope you'll visit our 90th anniversary webpage, which features many opportunities to engage with us from virtual tours to uh, speaker series. And we actually have a series lecture coming up next Friday, the 28th, highlighting a few of the lab's unique large scale facilities like the advanced light source and the 88 inch cyclotron. So we'd love to have you join us for those. Um, today, as folks might know, Berkeley Lab researchers are focused on a number of research areas from developing sustainable energy and environmental solutions to creating useful new materials to advancing the frontiers of computing and probing the mysteries of life, matter, and the universe. Our main campus is nestled in the Berkeley Hills above the UC Berkeley campus, and we employ about 4,000 people, 1,700 of whom are scientists, engineers, and faculty members. More than 500 of our employees are undergraduate and graduate students. These are folks who are just beginning their research journey. So, you know, Berkeley Lab's proximity to Cal and our close ties to the UC system are you know, really uh, geared at creating a unique and synergistic environment for scientific discovery. And a number of our lab's researchers are affiliated with one of the UC campuses, either as students, postdocs, or professors with joint appointments. So as you can imagine, Berkeley Lab's relationship with UC Berkeley is especially close, and our institutions have joined forces to advance science across a number of frontiers. One of the main motivations for creating Midday Science Cafe, as you know, is to share with you examples of compelling and complementary research from both of our institutions. And we hope you enjoy today's presentation on machine learning. Uh, and now it is actually my pleasure to introduce our first speaker to the screen, Tess Smith. Tess is the 2018 Alvarez Postdoctoral Fellow in Computing Sciences at Berkeley Lab. 
Her current research interests include building neural networks from first principles for rich data types, like those found in scientific data sets, and accelerating existing techniques and creating new capabilities for computational chemistry and material science. Tess earned her PhD in physics from UC Berkeley in 2018, so go Bears, and as a grad student, she used quantum mechanical calculations to understand and systematically design the geometry and corresponding electronic properties of atomic systems. During her PhD, Tess spent a year as an intern on Google's Accelerated Science Team, where she developed a new type of convolutional neural network called tensor field networks, which can naturally handle 3D geometry and properties of physical systems. As an undergraduate at MIT, Tess engineered giant neutrino detectors and created a permanent science art installation on the MIT campus called the Cosmic Ray Chandeliers, which illuminate upon detecting cosmic ray muons. If you visit our website, you can see some of the photos and video of the installation, which is pretty cool. So Tess, with that, let me turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jen, uh, for the wonderful introduction, for the invitation. I'm really excited to share with all of you today some of the research that I work on and some of the problems I find interesting. And again, I'm really proud to represent today Berkeley Lab, which as Jen said, is just an amazing place to do research that will hopefully help for the betterment of humanity. And it's also nice that we happen to have, I believe, the best view uh, in the Bay Area. So this is the view just outside of my office. Uh, this is the Golden Gate at sunset. So today I'm gonna to be talking to you about neural networks and specifically neural networks that have something called Euclidean symmetry and why this is so important. If we want to build models that understand physics and physical systems. So I'm hoping that in this brief presentation, I'll answer the four following questions. First of all, what is artificial intelligence versus machine learning versus neural networks and deep learning? What are all these words? What do they mean? How do we organize them? Then what is different about neural networks that we use for science versus other types of data like images or text? Then uh, why are neural networks with this special property of Euclidean symmetry, why is it so good at handling 3D data? And then last but not least, how these methods can help us do science. And specifically materials physics, which is what I got my PhD in, and it's a uh, research area that I'm very passionate about. Okay. So first, let's do an introduction to machine learning. And to keep things fun, we will use emojis. So first, a little bit of definitions. So neural networks and deep learning actually are describing the same thing, uh, the same type of method. And these methods are one of the many available methods within machine learning. And machine learning itself is part of sort of a broader effort of artificial intelligence. And the goal of any of these endeavors is to build some sort of model or some sort of program that learns to give predictions or perform actions based on examples that we provide it. So let's have a, a toy example of a task. So let's say we want a model that predicts an animal's favorite treat. So we will give it some input animal that we want it to predict a treat for. It'll give some output prediction. Um, and then we have examples of kind of our inputs and also the outputs that we want it to predict. And then our model has parameters that we will have to learn. The model will have to learn these parameters from our examples. So in order to give feedback to this model that we want to learn, um, we need some sort of loss function or error function, basically a judge that assesses, well, this is what you gave me, this is what I wanted, how far off are you? So maybe instead of predicting that chickens would like to eat chickens, uh, instead I would like my model to predict that the chicken in fact would like to eat bugs. And, but the reason why it's giving me bad answers is because my model is essentially untrained. My model parameters are random. So what makes neural networks special and different from other types of machine learning is that neural networks use derivatives, which are from calculus, in order to basically assess blame for which parameters in my model need to change uh, in order for my model to give better predictions. And so what we do is we take a derivative of the error with respect to every single little parameter in the model um, in order to basically say, hey, this parameter, this parameter, this parameter, uh, you guys need to change because you are the primary reasons why I am accidentally saying that a chicken wants to eat a chicken. Um, 
So this is our calculus finger of blame. And what's nice is that these derivatives, also known as gradients, will not only tell us which uh, parameters are to blame, but how they should change. Should they be bigger? Should they be smaller? Um, and so we can update our parameters such that now they give us the appropriate prediction. So during the training procedure, we will actually do this many different times with different examples. Um, and hopefully the behavior of the model will improve as we show it more and more examples. And eventually, once we are satisfied with the level of accuracy that our model gives for these predictions, uh, we consider our model trained and all these parameters are each special in their own way and contribute to different parts of the prediction. So that's kind of an overview of how neural networks are trained and how models um, kind of learn their parameters. And while this model only has nine parameters, uh, the types of models that are used in uh, image recognition and other types of applications typically have millions of parameters. So I couldn't fit all those on the diagram, but hopefully this small example gives you some uh, insight. Okay, so let's go back to neural networks. And neural networks are actually specially designed for different types of data or data types. And this is to make use of special features of the data. So for example, let's say I have images, I will use what's called a convolutional neural network to predict things like, is there a cat in this image? Or where is the cat in this image? Or how many cats are in this image? You would use a convolutional neural network and that will learn parameters that actually scan over the image in order to detect things like ears, eyes, whiskers, um, and bigger patterns like the face of a cat. So let's say I have a different type of data. I have sequential data like text or audio. I'll use something maybe like a recurrent neural network. And what a recurrent neural network basically encodes is that the meaning of the current word or the current part of a, of a, you know, a soundtrack, um, the importance of that piece depends on what came before it. So the meaning of the current word depends on what came before. And so that's the type of neural network you would use for sequential data. Um, let's say you have data that comes from like a social network or maybe you have a bunch of measurement devices that are talking to each other to measure earthquakes, you might want to use a graph network to represent um, like the layout of your detectors or um, different friends and friendships uh, across a social network. So the question arises then, well, what type of neural network do we use for science data in 3D? Well, let's first think a little bit about um, what data in 3D looks like. So to describe physical systems in 3D, whether it be big systems like galaxies or small systems like atoms, uh, we will typically use coordinates and coordinate systems. So let's say I have this benzene molecule, it has carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms, and I can go ahead and write down kind of the XYZ coordinates of these atoms like this. But if I rotate my molecule, now these coordinates are different. Um, so coordinates are really useful for writing things down, and especially if we want to write things down to give to a computer, but coordinates struggle with the fact that um, if I rotate kind of how I define my coordinate system, uh, these numbers will change, and this makes it a challenging representation for machine learning. Just to give another example, let's say I have a more complicated system. Now it's many different molecules, um, and I need to choose a coordinate system with which to write down where the atoms are in 3D space. Um, so in reality, there, there are no coordinate systems in 3D space. The coordinate systems are tools we use to write down the system and give it to the computer. So I could choose coordinate system one, I could choose coordinate system two, but they're really describing the same thing. It's just a different way of looking at it. So if I were to hand kind of the descriptions from coordinate system one versus coordinate system two, a traditional machine learning algorithm will not understand that Really, these are secretly the same thing. But the neural networks that I build that have this thing called Euclidean symmetry built into them, uh, it does understand that it's the same system. And it doesn't need to be trained to recognize that it's the same system. It just naturally understands that this is just a choice of coordinates. So that kind of fills in this gap here that what kind of networks might we use for scientific data in 3D? We might use a Euclidean neural network. And just to kind of hit home on what this means, 
So if I train one of these networks to identify this rabbit in this image, then it's guaranteed to be able to identify this rabbit without any further training. Um, it's able to identify it if I move the rabbit, if I flip the rabbit, if I mirror the rabbit, or if I rotate it. And so you get this free of charge, which is really nice because traditionally, um, even convolutional neural networks, you will get the translations, but it won't understand if you mirror it or if you rotate it, the network will be very confused. And this is especially important when you're dealing with things like atoms, because let's say I have a molecule and I want to predict the forces that each of these atoms experience, which I'm representing with these little arrows. Now, if again, I change my coordinate system, I want to make sure that my model predicts the same forces just rotated. And this is a guarantee that you get with Euclidean neural networks. Um, additionally, these networks, um, because they're, they understand these rotations and translations, they're able to recognize patterns and extrapolate to like molecules that are much bigger um, with very high accuracy, especially when similar patterns um, have been observed in the training data. So my background, what I got my PhD at Cal is, is uh, in computational material physics. And so what I do is that I will take an atomic structure. So for example, this is the crystal structure of silicon, which makes up the computer chips uh, in your computer. So if you basically take this box and you tile it in 3D space, this is what it would look like if you basically could zoom in to the individual atoms in the silicon on your computer chips. So what I would do is I would take crystal structures or molecule structures like silicon. I would use quantum theory and supercomputers, which if you're wondering what a supercomputer looks like, this, this is my dad and I standing in front of Cori, which is a supercomputer at Berkeley Lab that's part of the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center. And um, this is just one of the many rows of Cori. Cori has several rows, takes up a very large room. You can think of it as like, basically a computer that is like thousands of thousands of your individual computers. So it's a very large computer that we use to do science. So I would use these uh, big supercomputers with quantum mechanics um, and I would predict properties of these atomic structures. I might predict, well, where are the, the electrons? This is where the nuclei of the atoms are, but what are the electrons doing? And you know, given what the electrons are doing, is this a good material for like, photovoltaics or quantum computing or energy storage. So I can ask these questions with these sophisticated techniques. Um, but the problem is I have to use a supercomputer to do this and it takes a really long time. So there's many things that I hope that machine learning will help me do so I can get out there and find even better materials than the ones we already have. So first of all, I want to use machine learning to speed up these calculations so that I'm not waiting um, hours or days or months for a single quantum mechanical calculation. I can just go zoom and get the answers at the you know, snap of my fingers. I also want to hypothesize new atomic structures, like what might be an interesting material for us to investigate that we, we don't yet know might be out there. Um, and then also, you know, we have so many um, uh, needs for new materials, whether it be for energy, electronics, or medicine. Uh, given certain properties that I might have as, as desirable properties, can I find an atomic structure that satisfies all those properties? And then last but not least, you know, a big goal of science is to just understand the world around us. And so it would be great if machine learning can help us map this correspondence between atomic structure and then the properties that that astron atomic structure possesses. And I'm really excited to say that Euclidean neural networks are already helping us uh, towards a lot of these goals, especially for scaling expensive simulations um, so that we can better understand and design atomic systems for some of these applications. So two examples I wanna highlight are protein folding, which is the process by which you have an amino acid sequence. So just it's a string of numbers you can think of it as, and you go from that to a 3D folded protein structure. Um, and there was a recent development by DeepMind, which is a company in London, and they developed an algorithm called AlphaFold2, which is currently state-of-the-art for predicting um, protein folding. And they actually, inside of their network, and one of the pieces of it is using neural networks with Euclidean symmetry. So it's really exciting to see that stuff from my PhD uh, thesis is already sort of being applied to these types of problems. That's very exciting for me. 
um, and also exciting, I think, for the community. And then also being able to do large scale molecular dynamic simulations. So basically this is how do atoms move in the presence of each other so that we can predict uh, properties of materials, like what types of steel are gonna be the most strong for better buildings, or how do biomolecules interact with like proteins um, to understand how uh, medicines operate. And so there was a recent development at, with team members at Berkeley Lab to produce Deep MD, which was able to scale molecular dynamic simulations to 100 million atoms, which is a lot of atoms. We'd never done that before. And this team did it. And this is what 100 million atoms look like. It's about 50 nanometers squared, which maybe doesn't sound big, but it's a lot of atoms. And what's cool is that um, techniques like Euclidean neural networks are actually helping us uh, get to these kinds of results with even less data. So that means we can do it on even more complex uh, systems or with more accurate calculations. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up and just first of all, acknowledge my uh, collaborators. Science is so much fun and it's even more fun to do with friends. And here are some of my favorite people that I get to work with. Um, so, you know, all this work uh, is done very closely with all these wonderful people. So a quick recap. So we've learned that uh, Neural networks are a subset of machine learning and artificial intelligence. All give models that learn to give predictions based on examples. Neural networks are custom built for specific data types and scientific data has special features that other types of data don't have. And for this reason, uh, neural networks that understand Euclidean symmetry, rotations, translations, inversion um, are really good at identifying patterns that can appear in all these, these different configurations. And these types of networks are able to help us scale uh, really you know, computationally expensive or slow calculations and understand and design molecules and crystals for energy and medicine. And with that, I happily will take any of your questions. Thanks so much, Tess. So we're gonna actually ask you one or two questions from the audience right now, and then we'll save some of the other questions we've got for the, the end of our presentations. Uh, the first question we got is, so how, how do you calculate the gradient, uh, that is the effect of changing some parameter in the neural network? Um, this, this person thinks, does it come from lots of results from your error function? Yeah, so you will actually calculate the gradient. The, what we actually do in, um, in terms of coding is that we use specialized frameworks that have a property called auto differentiation. So we have, you can think of a program as a bunch of blocks of operations. And each of these blocks have sort of a forward definition and a backward definition. And so what we do is we chain all these blocks together. And when we perform these gradients, we're basically just reversing the neural network. And so we're calculating these gradients using what's called auto differentiation. So hopefully that answers at least part of the person's question. Thanks, Tess. And another question about uh, these Euclidean neural networks. How are they constructed? Uh, for example, how does it implement rotational and reflection invariance? Yeah, this is a great question. So I typically give a one hour lecture just explaining all these properties, but to give sort of the two second LDR, uh, TLDR um, is that they have specialized convolutional filters that are comprised of learned radial functions and spherical harmonics. And then they have to, instead of just scalar multiplication of like a number times a number is a number, it has the types of operations like a vector times a vector could give you like a three by three matrix. So, and this is basically the difference between scalar multiplication and tensor products. So we have to basically um, use tensor algebra inside these networks. So special filters and tensor algebra. Got it. Thanks so much for those explanations and thanks for a really interesting presentation. Let me actually turn it over right now to Rosalind who will introduce our next speaker and we'll get to some of the other questions we got for you after, the, uh, after that next presentation. Great, thanks everyone for the questions. Thank you so much, uh, Jen and Tess. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Daniel Brown, our next speaker. Daniel is a postdoctoral scholar at UC Berkeley. His research focuses on helping robots to safely and efficiently interact with and learn from humans. He received his PhD in 2020 in computer science from the University of Texas at Austin. Prior to his PhD, Daniel worked for the Air Force Research Labs Information Directorate in Rome, New York, 
where he researched bio-inspired swarms and multi-agent systems. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees from Brigham Young University and spent two years as a church missionary in Japan. In his spare time, Daniel enjoys reading, jazz music, playing strategy board games, and spending time with his wife and three kids. We are very excited to have Daniel here with us. So Daniel, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Great, thank you for that great introduction. And yeah, very excited to be here. So today I'll be talking about how we can help robots learn from, predict, and better assist humans. And so what motivates a lot of my work is the idea that we want to get robots out into the world in a variety of really complex situations. And we as people live in you know, an amazingly complex world. And there's all sorts of different tasks we perform Everybody has different preferences on how they perform those tasks. And ideally, we'd like to get robots out there that are able to learn from people, assist people under a variety of different preferences and situations. However, this can be really hard for a robot. And so today, I'll be talking about some of the challenges that a robot faces and some of the work we've been doing to try and bridge that gap between where we are now and where we'd like to get to in the future. In particular, I'll be talking about three different areas starting off with how we can allow robots to learn from people in ways that are natural for people to teach them, how robots can use models of human behavior in order to better predict and interact with these people, and how robots can better assist people. And so a lot of this work is kind of based off a branch of machine learning called reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is a type of machine learning where we have a robot or some kind of computer interacting with an environment. And in this case, the robot takes an action and that affects the state of the world. It affects what happens. Maybe the robot you know, turns its head. That's going to give it a new observation. You know, maybe it can now see something it can't see. And in reinforcement learning, the robot also receives a signal, what we'll call a reward, which is just simply a number that tells it whether it's doing something that's good or bad. So you could think of how maybe you teach your dog by giving a treat every time it does something good. Similarly, we can have these computer systems or robots learn how to perform better actions by receiving rewards or penalties. And reinforcement learning is a way of teaching a robot how to perform a task via trial and error, where the robot performs different actions and then looks and sees what rewards it got and then learns how to behave in the environment to maximize the rewards. And this type of a setup has been shown to work really well. For example, um, Google's AlphaGo was recently able to beat the, the world champion in this really complex board game called Go, where this computer program trained itself and was able to learn via trial and error how to play a really good game of Go. Similarly, some of the work that we've done here at Berkeley is in teaching a robot how to pick up a weirdly shaped object, where the robot, through trial and error, tries different ways of picking up the object Every time it succeeds, it redrops the object and it falls into a new position. And over time, it learns how to pick up the object, no matter in which position it lays on the table. So one thing you might wonder, though, is where does this, this reward function come from? Because this is really the signal that drives the learning in these reinforcement learning problems. And typically, this is an engineer or a computer scientist or roboticist that sits down and spends a lot of time figuring out what the right signals are that it should send to the robot to give it clues as to whether it's doing good or bad at the task. And while this might be easy for something like a game where it's like, you know, plus one if you win, minus one if you lose, or picking up an object where you can just give a reward of maybe, you know, plus one every time you pick it up, it can be really complicated in domains such as driving, where it's really hard for a person to sit down and write down math or write down a computer program that will give a reward that will lead to really good driving behavior. But it's actually pretty natural for a human, anybody, to actually give a demonstration of what they think good driving looks like. And so often for complex tasks, it can be easier to actually give an example than to actually write down an explicit kind of objective that you want the robot to accomplish. So this is where a lot of my research is focused on, this idea of reward learning, or what's often called inverse reinforcement learning where we have a robot that's observing, say, a person interacting with the environment. The person is taking actions, receiving new observations, and they're acting in a way that you know, maximizes some internal reward. You know, they have some intent, some goals and motivations. And the robot here 
doesn't get access to that. That's inside the human's head. And they have to reason about, you know, why did the human do this in this situation? You know, what is the human's reward function? What are they actually trying to do? And so by learning a reward function, the robot can try and infer the intent of the person. And as Tess talked about, we're going to use machine learning for this as well, where we have some model that comprised of you know, a whole bunch of numbers. This could be like a neural network model that's our reward model. And our inputs here are going to be observations and actions. And we're going to try and predict a number as an output of reward that we can use to kind of model the human's behavior in terms of what their intent is. And so we're going to start off by talking about how a robot could use reward learning in order to learn complex tasks, in particular in ways that are natural for a human to maybe teach a robot. And so it's pretty natural when we teach somebody something to show them you know, good and bad examples. And so one of the things we've recently looked at is how robots could learn from ranked preferences over demonstrations. So if I give some examples of how to perform a task and I give some preferences over them, then maybe I say that you know, this example is better than this example, but worse than this other example. And this is nice because you actually don't need to provide you know, the best examples. Maybe this is a task that a human struggles to perform really well at, but they can show you things that you shouldn't do and things that are maybe OK. And the insight here is that if we find a reward function that allows the robot to explain the rankings, it might allow the robot to kind of extrapolate beyond the best demonstration. So as an example of this, here's a simulated robot that we were trying to teach how to run. So this robot is trying to run to the right as far as it can. And we gave it some ranked examples, ranging from terrible. So here the robot is just kind of like scooting on its face, not making much progress. And then we gave it several more examples of increasing um, quality up to this best example that we gave it, which is you know, doing better, but kind of like a toddler it runs and occasionally face plants. And the idea here is that we want our algorithm to learn a reward function from these set of ranked examples. In particular, what we're able to do is we learn a reward function that is able to key in on what the good and bad things are, given these preferences, and is able to learn a reward function that allows it then through trial and error to learn a much better running behavior than was ever seen in these demonstrations. In this case, able to run about twice as fast and as far as the best example. And so how do we do this? At a high level, basically we have, say, two examples. If we say example B is better than example A, we want to be able to score these examples so the score for B is higher than the score for A. And so we're able to take you know, these little snippets of behavior and essentially feed them through our reward model. It's going to output a score for the example A and similarly output a score for example B. And then we train this model, like Tess mentioned, via calculus so that it outputs higher scores for the better ranked examples. And so this is a nice way for robots to learn naturally from people and from their preferences. I'm now going to kind of shift gears and say, OK, what else can we do? So let's say that we've learned maybe a model of a human's reward function. How can we use that to better predict a human's behavior? This is something that you know, is really important, say, in like a self-driving car application, where a self-driving car has to reason about the behavior of other people, other drivers, other, other pedestrians. And if it uses a too simple model, it may actually lead to like unintended side effects. So this is an actual video footage that, footage that I found of a self-driving car. This van here has its turn signal on. You can tell it wants to merge onto this busy highway. However, it's not able to find a sufficiently large gap that it thinks it can safely merge. And so instead of doing what a human might do, which is you know, start to edge into the traffic, assuming that the other drivers will give way, you can see as it pops up, it eventually just like exits the freeway. And I'm not exactly sure what algorithm it's running, but something that could have happened here is that it has just a very simple model of human behavior and really underestimates how it can influence the other human's behavior. And so we wanted to experiment with this. And so we built a very simple simulator where we allowed people to drive a car. And then we inferred a reward function that we thought best modeled human driving behaviors. And so now when we have our robot car, we're going to give it access to uh, what we call a model ladder, a set of different models that it can use to try and predict human behavior, ranging from models at the bottom that are really low compute. So you can think about compute as like maybe the amount of time it takes to use this model or the amount of energy it takes. And then we have you know, medium level models that you know, take a little bit more compute. And then very complex, you know, high fidelity models that maybe take a lot of time or a lot of energy. But as we move up this model ladder, we get better and better accuracy at the cost of higher compute. 
And so our insight here was that if we have this ladder of models, that we could dynamically switch between these models to try and optimize both our accuracy as well as minimize our compute. And so as an example, here's kind of a simulation of that merging example that we saw in the video, where we have the robot in orange and the human in blue. And if we just use a very simple model of the human and just assume that they're always going to keep a constant fixed velocity, the robot doesn't think it can merge safely. And so it's not able to complete this behavior using a very simple model. However, if we give it access to more advanced models that actually think about what the human's thinking about and think about the human having a reward function, we're able to actually successfully complete this merger. And so in this case, we give it access to three different models. And as you watch this again, you can see this bar, the color bar is changing as it changes the models it's using. And so it uses a very low fidelity, low compute model when it doesn't need to use a higher fidelity model. And this allows it to switch back and forth and get good behavior with low compute. And so we've talked about some prediction. And now we're going to switch at the end of the talk to how robots could use a model of human behavior, and in particular, a reward model, to better assist a human. And this work is motivated by the idea of assistive robotics. This is a video I found of a young woman who has muscular dystrophy. And so she has very limited upper body strength and mobility, but she's able to use this motorized wheelchair and a robotic arm to perform really complex tasks, like you know, feeding her dog or getting a drink of water. However, this is still pretty complicated. She has to use a joystick to control you know, the different joints of this seven degree of freedom robot. And so it would be nice if we could create robots that are easier for someone like this to control. And this is the idea of shared autonomy, where we want to take a user's input, maybe a user's controlling a robot, and allow a robot to try and predict what it thinks the human is doing. We can then blend what the human's doing and what the robot thinks the human's goal is in order to get better robot actions that hopefully you know, minimize the amount of effort the human needs. However, this can sometimes go wrong if the human does something unexpected. This is a simple example where the robot knows that you know, the human has these two goals shown in you know, purple and green that sometimes they like to move the robot arm to. But this time the robot or the human actually decides that it wants to perform a pouring action over here in that, at this red location. And this is an unknown skill the robot's never seen before. And so it makes this prediction. It says, well, I think you're going towards the green goal, so let me help you out, and actually hinders the human and doesn't allow them to accomplish their desires. And so our insight here was that we should really give full control to the human if this robot is really unconfident in the goal of the human. And in those cases, we should actually learn from this new data in order to learn new skills so we can better assist the human in the future. We call this method confidence-aware shared autonomy, or CASA. And so before learning a new skill, what CASA does is it is able to recognize pretty quickly that it's really unconfident about what it thinks the human is doing. And so it lets the human drive the robot pretty much all the way to the goal. And so you can see the number of keys. So in this study, we allowed humans to interact with these, these simulated robots by driving them using keys on their keyboard. After seeing this new skill and learning a reward function that models that, CASA is able to pretty quickly infer that, hey, if you're moving in this direction, I think I know what you want to do. Let me take over. And so you can see that the number of keys is pretty constant, and the robot's able to finish this task and perform this pouring motion. So as to recap, we've talked about how robots can better learn from, predict, and assist people by learning reward functions that really model human intent. And uh, yeah, I'd like to give a Big shout out to all my brilliant collaborators who have worked on these projects with me and without which you know, none of these projects would have happened. And so with that, I'd like to end and yeah, open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel, for that wonderful presentation. Um, just a reminder to folks, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in our chat box as well as our Q&A box. Um, so Daniel, a couple of um, things that we were wondering um, what, in your kind of personal experience, has been the most challenging aspect of working with robots? Um, I think the robots are, are always very challenging, yeah. And so I think a lot of the stuff that I showed is, you know, was done in simulation, just because that's like a good starting point. But yeah, every time you deal with like an actual physical robot, you have to deal with like things breaking. You know, like nothing, nothing is really known in the real world. You know, we can have like nice models of, you know, how the robot might move about friction and different things like that. But when you 
actually get into the real world, there's you know, a lot of uncertainty. And so even just like dealing with robot perception and you know limitations in mechanics is always hard. And then when you like throw like a human in the loop, I think that makes things even harder because people are just kind of inherently hard to predict. And so I think that's what like makes it challenging, but also fun to think about is yeah, how can you get robots, yeah, interacting with you know noisy and messy humans in like messy environments. And so I think having like these physical systems is definitely like one of the biggest challenges. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to go ahead and invite uh, Tess and Jen back onto the screen so that we can do a much uh, larger Q&A with the whole group. And one question that I think um, for both of you is, you know, besides the applications that you've mentioned, are there other machine learning applications um, that you're most excited about seeing in the future and, you know, impacting the world that we live in broadly? You want to take that first, Daniel? Sure. Yeah. So I think, I think, yeah, doing like robotics, I think there's lots of like really cool applications, like some of the ones I talked about, like, you know, self-driving cars, you know, assistive robotics, rehabilitation. But I think also like I'm very yeah excited about, I think the future of like assistive technologies just for like everyday people in terms of like having kind of your own like per personal assistant that can like help you manage your schedule, help you find information more quickly, help you like, you know, brainstorm ideas. I was thinking about like you know, the, the Avengers movie, you know, like Iron Man, you know, people talk a lot about the suit, but I think like his like computerized system Jarvis is even more impressive, like something you can talk with in natural language that can like help you solve complex problems, design cool things. And so I think having these like really intelligent interactive assistants is something I'm pretty excited about. Yeah, I mean, uh, similar to some of what Daniel said, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, creating tools for design, whether it be of molecules or buildings, basically learning sort of new languages with which we can kind of articulate, well, we want a little bit more of this or a little bit more of that. So easier ways to articulate complex designs for technology as well as art. Fantastic. Thanks both. Um, so Tess, I've got a couple questions for you that have come in about Euclidean neural networks. So this is a question that's got three different parts. Um, so let me start with the, the first part. Do Euclidean neural networks require programming input to limit the degree of precision to apply when calculating coordinate changes under rotation? Here's the second and third parts. If so, uh, how do you determine what level of precision is sufficient? And are there limits to the precision that can be applied? Yeah, this is a really great question. Um, I think if I'm interpreting it correctly, it's saying like, basically how does numerical accuracy play into the role of preserving a symmetry? Because symmetries are kind of thought of as absolutes, but yet when we do stuff on computers, we can only do it to finite precision because of how we represent numbers in the computer. So the way that this comes up is that um, the way that the network is uh, defined, it's actually like, you can kind of think of it as like a space of functions that it's allowed to learn. And so it doesn't actually, it doesn't matter too much about the numerical accuracy of the actual com computation. It's more about what operations do we even allow it to use? So it's only allowed to operate in certain ways that preserve symmetry. And so it's not actually sensitive to the numbers themselves. It's like the arithmetic that we use. So uh, it's a great question. And uh, we sometimes for different applications will want more accuracy or less accuracy. And that will change whether we use like float 32 or float 64, so different levels of numerical accuracy. So, so that's where that comes up. But for the symmetry itself, it's the operations and not the numbers. Got it. Thanks, Tess. Um, and let me actually ask this question from Daniel, which just came in. So when the simulated robot dog provided examples of different quality for walking, you know, falling down at first, but getting better, how does the learning system pick out what features or motions are useful and should be learned from? Yeah, that's a great question. So that's kind of the, the magic and mystery of deep learning is like, you know, we don't know exactly what like these networks are always paying attention to but i think like intuitively yeah if i give like you an example like you know a is better than b is better than c 
then like if you're able to like accurately like score these examples, then in some sense you have to be picking up on what things are better and what things are worse, because that's kind of like the only way you can differentiate these. And so we're asking this like machine learning model, we're training it by giving it pairs of examples, essentially saying like, which one do you think is better? Comparing their answer, like the algorithm's answer to the human's answer and making sure they match. And so the hope is that this algorithm will pick up on things that the human you know, thinks make things better or worse. That's not always guaranteed to happen. Uh, but I think, yeah, and like, that like kind of robotic dog example, I imagine it's picking up on things like, you know, how fast it's moving, kind of it gets on um, access to like joint angles and things. And so I think there's probably some kind of complicated things that it's like reasoning about, but eventually like allow it to like think that, okay, like, yeah, moving faster to the right, you know, not tipping over are better, you know, tipping over and like moving slower, or, like face planting are worse. And then once it's kind of figured out what the good and bad things are, it's able to, like through trial and error using reinforcement learning, experiment with different things and figure out, okay, what's the best way to like maximize the good things but minimize the bad. Thanks so I much. Some, oh. oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Is it okay if I add a little bit to that? Just to augment, I think what Daniel's saying. Um, like, I like to think about, you know, okay, so we think of deep learning, like, yeah, it's kind of this black box, but the, the, the thing that you get to do is that rather than be an architect of like the specific computer program, you're kind of giving the guidelines and you're, you're the architect of the training task. And so all the artistry and all the skill that comes from having experience in these techniques is constructing a, a basically like the scaffold for an effective program and then letting the learned parameters kind of fill it in. So we actually have a pretty good sense at least of like, what are the options for operations that the network will use? We just maybe don't know how much of this operation versus that operation it's going to use. Um, so it's like uh, Daniel's doing all this like supremely clever stuff of how do you actually construct a learnable task to assess reward functions. And so it's just a super cool, super cool aspect of his research. Thank you both uh, for those thoughtful answers. Uh, we had another question come in the chat, um, kind of regarding the ethical implications of your work. Uh, they asked, have any of you given thought to the possible downside of artificial intelligence? Um, you know, that the system could game against the human under unforeseen circumstances as complexities increase. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know, Daniel, if you want to go first, uh, since I think robotics, this comes up more, but um, at least in terms of, you know, concepts like, um, you know, what if someone wants to use this to design a molecule that's really dangerous to people and things like that. Um, yeah, so this is stuff that I do definitely think about. Uh, one thing that's maybe working in our favor is that currently it's still extremely hard to make things. So certain types of organic molecules are like pretty easy to make. Also, there's actually a lot of dangerous molecules that we just readily have available already. And fortunately, people don't tend to use them to do terrible things most of the time. Um, but yeah, no, this is something that is a concern, um, but it is really still hard to make things. And you definitely have to weigh the benefit. I think there's just so many benefits to, you know, making a more energy efficient materials so that, you know, people can read live richer lives worldwide. So I think the benefits really outweigh the dangers, but it's always something that I keep in the back of my mind. Yeah, I guess building off that, I think it's, yeah, I think it's definitely something that's important to think about. Like, yeah, I think a lot of people are often like, you know, worried about like, you know, killer robots taking over the world. And I mean, maybe that's like a fear for like the far future. That's not really something that keeps me up at night. But I do think that there are like more near term things like, you know, machine learning models that maybe like predict credit scores and like focus on like someone's like, you know, race or like their zip code or things like that. And like making decisions based on like kind of unethical like aspects of like a person's application. Thinking about like, yeah, robots, something I'm very interested in is like making sure that these robots are safe and that they can like interact with people in safe ways that they can come up with kind of confidence bounds on their performance. And so it's not just like a total black box that you feed in data and you cross your fingers and hope that it's gonna work. But a lot of my PhD work was focused on how do we actually allow like humans to kind of like better kind of introspect into like a robot's confidence in what's learned. And if we have a robot that's like really like unconfident about what it thinks the human's trying to teach it, 
then like, you know, that's like a signal that like it needs more data. And I've looked at things like how, how can a, a human kind of like give like better teaching examples? That's one thing I like about like kind of this examples of giving like positives and negatives kind of failures and successes is you could actually kind of be very kind of pedagogic and try and teach a robot that like these are areas you should stay away from. These are areas you should go towards them. And I think it's yeah important to have kind of a human in the loop as well that can yeah hopefully like you know stop the robot if it's about to do something unsafe but i think having yeah systems that kind of reason about uncertainty is definitely important and a lot of the onus is kind of on like the engineer in terms of like what objective do you like program in and if you program like the wrong objective like sometimes these can be gamed and so i think that's like an open area of research that's yeah very important is thinking about how to make like the right objectives or how to like allow like human robots to kind of learn the objectives from humans, but still be robust to their uncertainty over what the human actually might want them to do so that they'll actually be safe. Thanks both. I know it's, it's quite a thought provoking question. It's interesting to hear your answers. Um, so thank you. Uh, let me actually turn it over to a couple more technical questions. It sounds like we've got some folks who are studying AI machine learning in the audience. So uh, bear with me while I ask these. And I think maybe test these are, I think geared toward you, but Daniel, we'd love to hear your thoughts as well. So the first question is, um, how is Euclidean symmetry manifest in the structure of the network? Um, and then let me ask you one more. Um, and this is sort of a specific question. Somebody's learning about steepest descent uh, and saddle points, which I guess are false minima. These are questions clearly that I'm not <laughs> sure if I'm asking the right way because I am not an expert in this area, but hopefully this makes sense. The question there is, how do you verify in the algorithm that a minimum is, tr is a true minimum? Yeah, so uh, we don't we don't actually know if something is like a, a true minima. I think what you kind of hope is that there's lots of ones that will give pretty good answers, and that as you add more data, you can kind of these false minima can you can find better ones. But um, I think in in these types of optimization problems, we're looking for something that has the characteristic correct behavior, but it doesn't need to be the best necessarily. We also tend to um, train lots of different models and use ensembles, and this overcomes some aspects of it, but I'm, I'm sure Daniel also has a lot to add on this. Yeah, I guess, can you rephrase the question again? Sure, definitely. So um, that second one about um, a sort of steepest descent. So the question is, when this person learned steepest descent, they learned about saddle points, which are false minima. Um, so the question is, how do you verify in the algorithm that a minimum is a true minimum? Yeah, and I think, I don't know if I have much more to add than like what Tess said. I think, yeah, this is like kind of a wide open question. Like, I feel like there's a lot of like theoretical people like, yeah, trying to understand how neural networks work, why they seem to work well, even though like we only kind of have guarantees that they'll find something that's like locally optimal. Like there's nothing that says it has to find the, like, the absolute best solution. And so I think that's kind of, yeah, open-ended. Like it seems like these models have so many parameters that it's often very hard for them to get stuck somewhere. That like there's often always like some direction that you can move to kind of improve. And so I think it's like likely that it finds like something that's close to optimal, but it's always really hard to know, like especially as like a practitioner as you're training an algorithm, like you never know if it's kind of like in a plateau area. And if you just train it like another day, if it'll like find something that's like 10 times better, or whether you've found kind of like the best that you can do given the data. And so I feel like, yeah, there's a bit of like kind of engineering involved there in terms of yeah, like trying to find the right data, like Tess mentioned, like finding the right architectures. And then there's a lot of tuning involved in these networks to like try and make sure that they converge to good solutions. But I feel like, yeah, it's always kind of an open question of whether there's like a better solution out there that you just didn't like tune things right and couldn't find, which makes it kind of exciting, but also sometimes frustrating. Yeah, and to add to that, I think there's, there's also many different types of optimization strategies. So some will use something called momentum. So not just the instantaneous like gradient or steepest descent, but like kind of accumulated gradients and, and things like this. Um, so there's, there's many different, like there are people whose expertise is purely in optimization. So it's a very rich area. Um, so th those people would probably be better to answer the question specifically. Um, 
I guess one, one note about the Euclidean symmetry uh, question, how does it manifest in the network? And again, it's, it's basically um, uh, the way we treat the data. So the data isn't, they're not just numbers. Uh, they, they, tra they travel in packs. So like if you have a 3D vector, you treat that, those three numbers as, as kind of a, a special object. So you don't separate them. You don't act on them independently. You act on them together. And then additionally, again, this, this notion of tensor algebra and specialized convolutional filters. So we have to be consistent and, and treat everything such that we can kind of say, okay, well, what is a vector times a vector? Well, you have a dot product, which is a scalar. You have a cross product, which is um, another vector or you know, a higher order interaction. So that's how the symmetry manifests, which probably doesn't feel like a satisfactory answer, but I guess the math, the math answer is representation theory. Group representation theory is what we use to have that symmetry manifest in it. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good Wikipedia word. <laughs> Not that the article will be very clear. It's kind of a, it's kind of a um, complex uh, topic. But, yeah. Thank you both. Um, another kind of broad question that we got from the audience is, uh, how wide open do you think the field of machine learning is? And what they mean by this question is, um, how much more improvement in techniques and methods are likely to be discovered? Do you think the field has reached a point where most things have been discovered or is, is there still a lot more to know? Yes, I see Tess shaking her head. And yeah, I think I also agree that like, I don't think we've discovered nearly enough things to do like this kind of stuff that I think, yeah, we want to do and the kind of things that'll have like real impact in the world. And so I see it as, yeah, still being like very wide open I feel like, yeah, we still don't understand almost anything. There's still lots of open questions. I think, yeah, we understand like a few things like reasonably well, like very like, you know, specific kind of like, you know, classification problems, like, you know, is this an image of a dog or a cat? But even then, like there's still open questions as to like, you know, why if I like perturb a couple simple pixels here and there, does like my prediction change from like a dog to like an orangutan with like 99% confidence? And so I feel like, yeah, there's still tons of like really interesting questions out there, tons of applications as well. I think machine learning is starting to kind of move into all sorts of different fields, but I see, yeah, a pretty rich future. And I think, yeah, there's lots of room for lots of people to make good contributions. Yeah, just adding to that, I think even if you just think about the contributions that machine learning can have to science, I mean, I feel like we're just starting to see um, kind of the, this this beginning of scientific machine learning methods, if, if you pardon the terminology. And like, okay, well, how can we use machine learning to advance the analysis of data coming from these super rich data sources like uh, electron microscopes up at Berkeley Lab or the advanced light source up at the lab, which helps us like probe the inner structures of proteins and things. And so um, we really have yet to see uh, the true potential of all these techniques. So there's a lot of work to do. And uh, so we're gonna need as many uh, bright minds and different perspectives <laughs> as possible to help us solve all these challenges. Thank you so much. Uh, we were also wondering in the chat if um, it was, this question was posed to Daniel, but I think it could absolutely apply for both of you. Um, can you share examples of projects or companies that you find do interesting work in pushing the state of um, art robotics? And I think for Tess too, you know, if there are any resources um, that you'd like to share with the audience, we can also um, collect those from you and share them when we send out the recording of this video. Yeah, so I feel like, yeah, you just have to like Google cool robot videos on YouTube and you can find like more than you'll ever be able to watch. I think, yeah, like places like Boston Dynamics are always coming out with like amazing robots doing parkour, dancing the boogie. Um, places like Google have like experimented with really big robot farms where you have like, you know, 100 robots all like working like nonstop for like weeks, learning how to like pick up like all sorts of different objects that are like maybe deformable made out of cloth and just kind of like learning just by like kind of self supervision. I think like companies like Waymo, which does like it's kind of the, the spin off of the Google self driving cars are doing really cool things, you know, Tesla autopilot, I think. Yeah, there's, I think there's yeah no end to the list of like cool things that are happening. Yeah, with robotics and, and yeah, machine learning in general. Yeah, I think it's now hard to find companies that aren't using machine learning in some 
capacity technology company specifically. So, I mean, uh, machine learning is really being adopted widely for in pharmaceutical companies, for drug discovery, um, certainly for uh, development of materials for battery research. So um, th there's basically any of these companies in this space likely have a machine learning team. And I think there's just so many ideas coming out, um, a lot of really interesting work going on. Um, so I'd be hard pressed to like make a concise <laughs> list because I would just start naming every single company I can think of. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of a lot of interesting out there. Thanks both. Um, so a couple more questions. Uh, I think these are th these are for you, Tess, and they're uh, they're more sort of technical. So uh, the first question is: Would the Euclidean networks work on image data to recognize objects from pictures to video? And does the noise in the images make it difficult? Okay, so um, video and uh, image data. I'm assuming this is in two dimensions. So you uh, it would still work, but these models are um, even better if you have three-dimensional data. So if you have um, kind of the, the, that type of data lying around, which we often do in science, whether it's from tomography or x-rays or all these sort of uh, amazing characterization methods. Um, so it would work for that. As far as how noise works, it's actually kind of interesting. So it depends on the nature of the noise. But what we're finding is that if you, uh, in this case, you're restricting kind of the uh, functional form of the neural network so it can only be a function that respects Euclidean symmetry that can actually allow you to get rid of a lot of noise that it doesn't physically make sense but might be an artifact due to like a measurement process or some other um, reason uh, so these methods so Euclidean neural networks and other types of equivariant neural network methods are very robust to certain types of noise which is really interesting um, so I think that at least partially answers uh, those questions Thanks. And uh, Daniel, I don't know if you have anything you might want to add in there. If not, totally okay. Just thought I'd check it. Yeah, okay. sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then one more sort of, I think, technical question for you, Tess. Uh, we've got somebody in the audience who's interested in the application of GANs in biomolecules. Um, so do you know of any work and applications of E3NN in this area? Yeah. Um... So generative models, so, so GANs, again, are a particular type of generative model where you basically sample from a specific distribution uh, that's easy to sample. So it's easy to, to like basically pick different examples and then uh, convert it into something that's something you want, so uh, molecules. Um, so there are examples in this space. Actually, I think there was a paper that just got posted on Archive yesterday. Uh, I think they're using what are called equivariant normalizing flows. So if you look up equivariant normalizing flows um, into Google, that'll come up. And so I think this is a really um, active space. Um, there are certain techniques that I'm working on um, that kind of approach, how do you do this in a hierarchical fashion? So basically you have atoms, they form little patterns and those atoms form other patterns and bigger and bigger patterns until we get macroscopic materials. And so I'm really excited to kind of work on generative models, whether it be GANs or autoencoders or just other general architectures that kind of can address this level of recursiveness of, of geometric patterns. So there's there's still lots of stuff to do, but there are also some really excellent proof of principle demonstrations in the literature. Got it, thanks Tess. Um, and you know, I think we'll ask one more question. Uh, for I think both of you before we before we wrap up, you know, it seems like um, you know AI and machine learning sort of go hand in hand with supercomputers. So I'm curious to know, you know, does machine learning become more useful as the speed and computational power of supercomputers grows? Um, and if you could talk maybe about what exascale computing is and how it might be leveraged to advance machine learning, I think that might be interesting, uh, sort of as we wrap up and and look forward. So uh, exascale computing, being at Berkeley Lab, exascale computing is a term that I, I, I run into daily. Uh, so exascaling, is, exascale computing is really exciting because it's going to help us be able to simulate system sizes that we couldn't even dream up before. So complex like simulations of pulsars or, and, and uh, which have like simulations at all scales. Um, we need those computers to do a lot of really expensive physics simulations. The hope with machine learning is that we can do even more of those types of calculations, but without using as much compute, because um, you know we can only build 
so, you know, like uh, large and larger supercomputers, but it'd be great if we can just get more out of our compute. So I think that's how machine learning is gonna really help us on the scientific computing side. And I think the hope is that we will not need as much compute for these models. On the flip side, if you have a sufficiently complex machine learning model, you may in fact need that compute. And I think this comes up a lot when you have lots and lots of uh, training data. So I think that, and, and that probably goes more into to Daniel's area of these really complex uh, models. So I'll hand it to Daniel. <laughs> yes, I think definitely like if you have, yeah, bigger and beefier computers with more compute power, I think, yeah, you can do a lot more. You can train, you know, bigger models that can like, you know, ingest larger amounts of data. And yeah, it's been kind of interesting to see like that as people just kind of scale up the amount of like GPUs or CPUs that they're running on these problems, they're able to get, you know, better and better performance. And so, so I think, yeah, that's like one, one aspect of things. I think that's kind of fueled the recent like successes in machine learning is that we have really, you know, beefy computer systems, you know, really specialized hard, hardware devices that make these computations really fast. And we also have just like tons of data nowadays you know, with the internet and so many different you know, data repositories. And so I think as computers, yeah, get more and more advanced, I think that will help. I think there are also like lots of, um, I guess, potential like problems with just making our computers, you know, bigger and bigger and taking up more and more energy. You know, there's like, you know, concerns about like, you know, carbon emissions and things like that, that like some of these models are just, you know, so insanely big, they use so much electricity. And so I think it's interesting to see people also looking at, like, how can we like, you know, maybe come up with better architectures for like our computers or like more, you know, smart ways of like actually like training these, you know, machine learning models that maybe don't require, you know, huge supercomputers. And so, so I think, yeah, I see like, I think, Computers will become like more and more advanced and people will like leverage those. But I think there's also avenues towards like trying to make these faster and like test sets so we don't like need supercomputers and hopefully can can yeah learn models that are like just you know much faster and you know more compact. Yeah, and just to add slightly to that too, like just just for a point of comparison, um, you know, I have models that I might use in my research where I used to have to do a calculation um, that would take hours or days on the supercomputer on you know hundreds of CPUs. And now I can with this with a trained model, I can run it in a split second on my laptop. Um, so I, I think it's going to be a real game changer. I also think it's going to make um, these types of computational insights much more accessible to folks who may not have a supercomputer at their disposal. So that they can if Basically, we kind of create some sort of pipeline where we're creating good training data and training good models that can be verified. You can use this effective model to get physical insights to help you get that next intuitive leap. And so I think that's going to really open up science to a broader community. Um, and that's really exciting. Definitely exciting for sure. Um, well, you know, I think that brings us to the close of our event. And before we say goodbye, I just want to thank Tess and Daniel one more time for their really exciting and engaging presentations. And I also want to thank the audience for their great questions. We appreciate you tuning in and uh, and sharing with us your thoughts. Um, so with that, I'd say if you're interested in staying up to date on research coming out of Berkeley Lab or UC Berkeley, you can visit us uh, on the internet, uh, scienceatcal.berkeley.edu and uh, lbl.gov. So with that, thanks so much. Have a great afternoon. We hope to see you for the next in the Day Science Cafe. Yeah, thank you all for everything. This was super fun. Thanks for having us and thank the audience for so many great questions. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, Have a good afternoon. Thank you.